So we've talked a lot about prepping to create your logical theta model. Now let's get into the gnarly details. Rule number one with Apache Cassandra is that we want to nest data. That means group the data together on disk as much as possible. Remember those queries I keep talking about? We want to hit our table, go find our rows. We want all that data aggregated together in the same spot and return it back to the client. If you got your data in one place and can return it like that, you're golden. In the previous section, we talked about partition per query. This is the most ideal access pattern. In order to achieve this, we need to nest our data. By far, the most common way of doing so is by using clustering columns. However, you can use collection columns like lists and maps, or you can use user-defined types, which we saw earlier. Clustering columns is pretty straightforward. Look at the actors by video table on the right. We query by our video ID, but then we nest the actors by their actor name and character name using clustering columns. So the partition key identifies the entity that other entities nest into, while the clustering columns identify the nested entities. We have actors identified by videos. Depending on your situation, you may want to be a little bit more lightweight and use user-defined types, which allow you to nest a few values inside of a single column in a table. Usually this occurs when you have a one-to-one -one relationship, but you can also have lists or maps or whatever you like of user-defined types within a single column as well. For example, we took our videos and turned them into a videos type, user-defined type on the right. We have ID, title, description, so on and so forth. And then we put all those videos in a collection column in the videos by user table. I'll admit this is a little bit of a contrived example. That's a lot of values to have in one user-defined type, only to put it in a table with a single partition key. Uh, but if you want to do so, go ahead. Really, this is more for lightweight situations. For example, you could see sticking an address inside of a user table instead. It's really up to you. One of the first disruptive experiences you probably had when coming to Apache Cassandra is the lack of joins. How do you get your data together in order to see what the relationships are? Fundamental concept in Apache Cassandra is we actually join on write instead of joining on read. In a relational database, just say select from here, join on this, and you're joining two tables as you read the data. But in Apache Cassandra, we don't want to take time to join values together to do a read. We just want to grab the data and return it to the client application. Thus, when we perform the write, that's when we actually materialize the join on disk. So it's optimal when we turn around and do a query on that data. Let's look at these examples. We have three tables that represent the videos object. We have videos by actor, videos by genre, and videos by tag. You could imagine in a relational model, you'd have a separate actors table, maybe a separate genres table, tags table. These would all be separate tables. But in this example, we've joined videos with actors, we've joined videos by genre, and we've joined videos by tag on disk in tables that we've materialized at write time. This obviously duplicates video data. Every time we want to store a new video, we have to write a record into each one of these tables, and we have to keep those records in sync. Yeah, that could be painful, but Datastax Enterprise has several tools to help you along with this as well. The important key concept is that we're writing tables to satisfy queries so that they can have constant time access. That is awesome. Consider the two situations we have here. On the left, we have a videos by actor table where we query off the actor. We get the video ID for every video that actor's been in. We then have to do another query on a second table to pull all that video information. Ugh, what a headache. Lots of queries, lots of network traffic. The user's just waiting to click off of your website. Compare this with the example on the right. We have the exact same setup for query one with actor, video ID, and character name but then we've stored the video information along with the actor information in one table. So I can query off the actor and get all the video information for that actor in a single partition. This is golden. It takes more space, yes. There's some synchronization headache on your side, or if you use Datastax Enterprise, then you have some tools to help you along with that, but your query time is constant, and that's great. So now that we have our conceptual data model, 
and our application workflow, let's see how we combine the two to create our actual logical data tables. We're going to discuss the mapping rules. They're super simple. Just follow through with them and you'll be golden. Here are the five mapping rules. Go ahead and tattoo these on top of each one of your fingers. They're simple, they're straightforward, they'll get you to the logical data tables. We first start with our entities and relationships, we then look at quality search attributes, we then further look at inequality search attributes, ordering attributes, key attributes. Let's look at an example. Remember, I said we need our conceptual data model and our access patterns to create the logical data table. Here's an example where we have both. We have user uploads video and we have the access pattern below it. We query on the user ID and on the uploaded timestamp and we have an ordering restriction as well which is on the uploaded timestamp. Mapping rule number one, model the entities and the relationships in a table. We're querying for videos uploaded by a specific user. So this entire relationship we store in a single table. Notice the table has all the attributes from user, all the attributes from video, and even the uploads attribute of timestamp. In a relational world, you may just look at the object and model it into a table, and that's very common. But here we're modeling an entire relationship type where all the attributes go into a single table. Mapping rule number two, equality search attributes. Remember, we're modeling for a query, and the first thing we want to look for is what are we saying equals on? In this case, we're querying for videos given a specific user ID. So we will say equals on the user ID. Thus, user ID becomes our partition key. Next, you need to identify what your inequality search attributes are. That basically means greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. You get the idea. We're not saying equals, but we're going to do a range. In this case, we're looking for videos with an uploaded timestamp greater than some value. Think about this as far as clustering columns are concerned. We first query on the partition key, and then we search through the clustering columns. Thus, we can do range queries, or greater than, less than queries, on the clustering column values. Thus, we make uploaded timestamp a clustering column following our user ID partition key. Next, you need to identify if there's any ordering constraints in your query. In this example, we want to order by the timestamp descending. Our uploaded timestamp is already a clustering column because of the previous mapping rule. However, we need to change the ordering from ascending to descending to satisfy our ordering constraint. If uploaded timestamp was not already a clustering column, here we would add it as another clustering column on top of the clustering columns we made from the previous mapping rule. Notice those four previous steps all had to do with the query we were performing. Remember, modeling for Apache Cassandra is first query driven and then we add uniqueness. This fifth step is just to satisfy that uniqueness constraint. Here we add our key attributes. The key attribute for a user uploading a video is the video ID because videos sit on the many side of the relationship type. Remember the example I gave you? Say I uploaded 10 videos of my cat, my user ID would show up multiple times, thus not being unique, but each one of those videos would have their own unique video ID. So the ID of this relationship type is the video ID. Thus, we add video ID as another clustering column at the end of our primary key. And that's it, you're done. You just have five mapping rules to take the conceptual model and the application workflow and create your tables. It's really that simple. So now it's your turn to have a little experience with combining these two inputs. Go ahead and hit your whiteboard again and create your conceptual data model.